Hello and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Eddie Pauline, a member of the Columbus Metropolitan Club's Board of Trustees and serve as the Director of Economic Engagement at The Ohio State University. When I say it's great to see you today, it is really great to see people back in this room. Over the past several weeks, racism and systematic bias is being acknowledged as never before. And there seems to be a strong momentum for real change. In our long-standing tradition, and for as long as it takes, CMC will work to develop forums that provide community space to explore these issues in our new series, Racism, Where Do We Go From Here? Today's forum, Young Black Men Speak, is live stream thanks to our live stream partners, WOSU Public Media, Dispatch Media Group, and PNC. We'd also like to thank all of you who purchased a virtual seat today. We are very grateful for this support and are able to continue live streaming services in large part because of you. Thank you. Complicated and complex, resolving the many issues of racism is an urgent task. People of all colors and backgrounds are engaged in demands for greater equity and justice. To begin to understand the challenges, listening to those whose daily lives are shadowed by racism is a reasonable place to start and where we will start today. What does life look like day to day for a young African American man? We are pleased to welcome three exemplary young leaders for a glimpse. Please welcome Michael Bivens, Andrew, <clears throat> Andrew Pierce II, and Playon Patrick will lead the conversation. Playon, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for allowing me to host today's forum with such important wishes to be heard. <clears throat> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to CMC's forum on young black men. Guys, I'm gonna jump off with the first question. So America has used policing and incarceration as a form to control the black community. What systemic changes do you think we can make, if any, to fix the broken system? Well, first and foremost, I would like to say thank you all for having me. Um, but when every question that I answer, I'm going to honestly answer from my heart. Do not look at my parents. Do not look at none of their, nothing that's just coming from me. Um, but this question actually has two parts. Uh, the first part would be police officers are, they apply for their job and they go through the train and everything and then they become police officers. The question that we need to ask them are, why do they want to become a police officer? And why do they want to police in certain neighborhoods? Because I just truly, in my heart, I feel like an officer from Heath should not come into inner city Columbus and police an urban environment. Um, the second part to that question, we are the people that elect these judges and the prosecutors. So we have to look at their temperaments. We need to look at what are their views to sentencing. And that's how we change the system, by putting the right people in place to make change. Agree with that. You have any thoughts? Yeah, um, I can. I would agree with everything that Mr. Bivens said, and also want to thank you all for having me here. Um, looking at our criminal justice system, I mean, we need to look at it holistically and strategically, and see how it controls the Black community, right? So, if we're looking at policing and incarceration, um, let's look at the incarceration for a second. Why is it that incarceration is used to control the Black community? Well, how do you control a community, right? Um, politically, let's look at how if you're incarcerated, if you have a felony on your record, you can't vote, right? Or if you're on parole or probation, you can't vote, right? So how many of us saw the Rayshaw Brooks funeral yesterday, right? One of the things that struck out to me with that pastor said was that one in 18 Georgians are on parole or probation. And with that incarceration on your record, how does that really control your future and how your destiny, how you can really build your community, right? If I can't get a job, I can't put financial um, independence into my community. If I can't own a lease, I can't have financial ownership in my community, right? So all this incarceration builds back into how we're really oppressing the black community, right? And looking at our officers that are coming into our community and policing us, saying, okay, if I don't know you, if you're from like Heath and I'm in Linden, I don't know who you are, right? So there's already a disconnect there between our police officers um, and our communities that they're supposed to be protecting. Yeah, so we need to be establishing a more connect, you know, approach to the police officers in our community. Definitely, but how do you think black men are viewed in America today? 
Chief. Yeah. So it all goes back to media, right? So America, we're the media power of the world, and how um, we reflect ourselves um, as a country in our media, in our media shows how we view certain um, groups, right? So for example, black men, you're either seen as a LeBron, as an athlete, you're either seen as a rapper, a Meek Mill, or you're a thug, right? Or you're a black exception, right? And that a black exception, someone who's in a suit, right, at a college, right? You see them, they're an exception. They're rare. They're not really what black men are supposed to be like. Exactly. Right? You're 21, you, do, you don't have any kids? Exactly. You're like, what? Mm -hmm. Like, And I've gotten those questions before on campus, of course. So media plays a huge role um, in how we're viewed um, as black men in America, of course. Exactly. 100% uh, would like to agree with what you said. That's actually very powerful. Um, from this, I can't really give a generic view because um, I cannot speak for every black man in America. But um, as you all see, I'm sitting here, I'm 220 pounds, African-American male, standing at, six, standing at six foot. And it's really just how you look at things. I could come off aggressive if you do not know me. If you do, I promise you, if you get to know me, I'm actually probably the most funniest person you'll ever meet in your life. I love cracking jokes. I love just having a good time. But when it goes down to when I'm walking up the street and, and a group, well, people that do not look like me have to cross the street just based upon how they view me, and I'm just walking up the street minding my business, it, it goes to show that they view as like aggressive. They might view me as a threat. So it just goes upon how can we really change that in, at some point. So, right. mm -hmm. but yeah, I feel like that's how it's viewed. Yeah, that negative portrayal definitely leads to a negative perception exactly. and negative outcomes. But when you look at the climate in America today, you have the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Rashad Brooks, and so many others. Why do you think white Americans fear young black men? It's ingrained into American culture, right? So if we look at my people struggle in this nation, we came over here, let's say 1619, um, for 300, 400 years, I was seen, my people were seen as less than human, right? Let's take it further. 50, for the past only 50, 60 years, I've been recognized as a full citizen, being given the right to vote, being given to go into any public space that I want to go into, right? So it's ingrained into the very fabric of America. So when we look at generations and looking at generational trauma and how we can um, pass on that trauma from slavery, right? I, I truly believe that you're also passing on that prejudice and that racism from the other side, right? So you may love my music, you may love my movies, you may love my basketball shoes, but let me actually talk to you. You, may, you really don't want to get to know me. You just want, you love the idea of me, but you don't love me. Exactly. That's, what, that's why black America fears the black man. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna answer that question with a question. Uh, First and foremost, uh, I just have the question, do, I'm gonna place out a group, do racist white Americans, do they fear black people or do they hate black people? Because there's a difference between, because if you fear something, you avoid it at all costs. You stay away. You don't even try to mess with it. But if you hate something, you do everything in your power to destroy it. You go, you do everything to try to kill it. And you try to nullify that whole entire description, the whole power aspect of things. So, but I'll give you an answer. The reason why they fear black America is because they do not want to share the power. Based upon everything in America, it's always about who has the most power. And whoever has the power, they're in charge. So why would they want to share that with the people that can make the change? So. There we go. Definitely, definitely power. Okay. If you want to keep going, though, what policies or reforms can police departments implement to see change in our communities? Oh, I got something for that. <laughs> Say oh, something. I got something. Go on. Go on. First and foremost, the policies that should be implemented are hold our police accountable for their actions, first off. Mm -hmm. But then also, I feel like there should be a policy on, let's, let, let's just start right here. Let's have a policy on not killing black people. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, let's see, and let's see how that changes, because I just feel like death should not be the, the, the first resort to everything. Because mm -hmm. honestly, um, you can go through every story in the book, um, unarmed black man, why is he being shot? Why is he a threat? You have the power, you have the gun in your hand. 
he has nothing. A black man is running away from the police. Why are there bullets put into his back? Does that make any sense at all? It, and even all of these crimes and everything like that, if they go to trial, they would not end up being the death penalty. So it just, it just blows my mind about how that really can be torn and twisted into you just lost a life and then the, and, and then the police go on trial and nothing happens. It just, it just blows my mind to this day. I agree with that and completely, but also holding our police accountable, putting in systematic practices and policies to actually police the police, right? So for example, um, if you shoot someone like Ahmaud Arbery or Rashad Brooks or George Floyd, I'm not gonna have that local police department investigate themselves. Because just human nature, if my brother commits a crime, yeah, I have a conflict of interest right there in prosecuting my own brother, right? So bringing in independent investigators, independent agencies to actually investigate these crimes of killing innocent black men, but also looking at the society and the culture culture of that police department, right? If this, let's say, let's take Columbus, for example. We live in a majority, a minority majority city, right? We have our Bhutanese community, our Somali community, our black community, but yet and still we have a police department with 87% um, black uh, white officers, right? So let's look at how we're systematically recruiting these police officers to actually police and provide security for our communities, right? Are we building partnerships with our Columbus City schools um, to say, okay, Fort Hayes, okay, Columbus downtown, I may teach you how to be a, a hairdresser, I may teach you how to be a cook, but no, let me teach you how to be a police officer, right? Let me teach you how to actually build your community. We don't want to just box our youth into certain holes and tell them that, no, this is what you're going to be. No, let's say, what can you be? right? Bringing in minorities um, to police our communities, but also within that, funding certain initiatives within the police department to promote community trust and community accountability, right? So if I just see a cop rolling around a patrol car 24-7, yeah, I don't know you. All I see of you is just, yeah, shooting me in the back, right? <laughs> right. But let me tell you something. Let's say if you're on a bike, right, and I know you, right? Mike, we went to high school together. Right. You on the bike, right? Like, okay, cool. Like, I know him. We need to actually systematically use these funds that were given to our police, use them smartly, strategically, and to build community trust. That's how you really reform a police department. Mm -hmm. Also, one more thing. Um, and even if somebody in the room knows the chief, um, there should be implemented a six months on the street, six months off the street. Because the thing about it is, just like what you said, if they build that relationship, it, it's all about relationship, because first and foremost, the police system is not implemented. It, it, it's a public service. It, it isn't implemented to be fear. It isn't implemented to be like, you're supposed to protect and serve. So by that aspect, you have to trust. It's all about trust. So that really should be implemented. Six months on the street, six months off the street. And building cultural competency along with that, right? So let's say you are that cop from Heath, right? Right? That came into Columbus. I need to make sure that you know, yeah, a Linden is very different than a Westerville, right? A New Albany is a very different than East Side, right? So making sure that our officers know those six months on the street, I'm getting to actually know the community that I'm actually within, right? Exactly. Yeah, I think those checks and balances are so important when we're talking about the police and our nation in general. Just we need to be having things balancing each other out so we don't have this, you know, overflow of prejudice or racism or anything, you know, blocking our systems. But the next question is, how have race and other forms of oppression been used to limit the growth of the black community? Oh boy. I got this one. Oh, no, go on. I got uh, it too. <laughs> first and foremost, if you're from Columbus, um, does anybody remember um, Old Town East? Gentrification. We're gonna go down into that and we're just gonna, that's one, that's one really big that I've seen in Columbus um, is gentrification. Another is redlining. You can go into redlining, you can see a Jamal, um, Jamal Henry, and then you see, and then you can see, um, let's give me a name, uh, Jim, Jim, uh, something else. Just, 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 just think about uh, somebody who doesn't look like me last name. So think about it like this and let's implement how we cross off Jamal based upon his name. That happens every single day in America. And the thing about it is my name might be Michael, but there might be a Jamal that's way more qualified than, than me, and honestly. And, and that Michael won't get written off just based upon his name being Michael. So that's, that's something that's really been implemented and it needs to go away. There's no reason why people are getting written off just based upon their name. I mean, going off of that, let's talk about redlining and let's get personal with it. Um, the American dream says that you come over to these shores, you own a house, right? 
that's like the biggest staple, white picket fence, leave it to beaver type um, atmosphere, right? Um, within the black community for so long and generationally, we were barred from even owning our own homes and barred and boxed into just certain neighborhoods with low property values, right? The, the strength of a community is based on a property value, but let's say you actually own your home, right? So let's take my grandmother's house, for example, who lives in Linden um, on Holt Avenue. You own a house, but that house um, is not up to code right, because you don't have the economic um, background to actually build that up, or if you can build up to a modern um, household, your neighborhood infrastructure can't support that house, right? So anyone who knows in Linden, if it rains, you're praying your basement don't flood because you understand that your um, sewage system for your street isn't up to code. And if anything, you want to go to the city and say, hey, my street, Holt Avenue, it's not up to code. Well, you're not due for a new sewage system till 2030. By 2030, I'm going to have kids, but you're telling me my grandmother's house that they bought in the 50s can't have adequate sewer system. But yet and still, you go to Clintonville, it's a whole different story, right? So economically, um, the way that our, the black community has been oppressed is financially, um, financial independence. The best um, way to build a community is to, through generational wealth, and the best way to build generational wealth is through land. If we don't have our own land, you can't build anything, anything on that land, right? So I'm going to get off track a little bit. My little sister and me were having a conversation yesterday, and she was like, well, why do I need to own land? I don't, if someone wants to come in and buy it from me, I'll just sell it to them. No. Own the land, lease the building. Right, too, too quick in the black community, we're told just sell, sell, yeah. right? Get out, right? Go to Dublin, go to Albany. If you can get out, get out, right? We need to start learning um, within our communities that if we can own the land and actually build up and exactly. build our communities, yes, that's where you can begin to systematically deconstruct the um, institution of oppression, right? Even education, right? Look at public schools versus suburban schools, right? right? Governor DeWine, $300 million cut from Columbus City Schools, and you have 31 schools and poverty-stricken um, highest rating, ratings, right? But letting still, you go to an Olin Tange where you have maybe one or two high schools and a higher property value for higher property taxes, you can take that budget reduction. But a public, Columbus public schools where you have 40, 46,000 students, you can't handle that, exactly. right? In a district that is mostly black people. Most recently, you may have heard people calling to defund the police. In what ways do you think that the government can invest funding to improve the success of young boys and young men of color? Well, first and foremost, we need to understand that the police, they're not the military. My father was a soldier, and the police are not the military, I promise you, not close enough. So all the money that's going towards, like, it, it goes towards things that can help, but it doesn't, all that money should not go into things that are tearing down the community more than it's uplifting the community, if that makes sense. But some groups that I would say, just take a portion of it, just take a portion of it, and put it towards men on the move. My brother's keeper, big, big brother, big sister. There's so many programs that will help the black youth, and not even the black youth, that will help the minorities all over Columbus. There's so many groups that will lift them up and help them. Also, if you go into it and you research, um, a lot of kids are not ready for kindergarten when, when, when it's time for them to go to kindergarten. A, a, the money that's going into the police system, uh, some of that money could go towards helping them get ready to know how to write their name, know their ABCs before they get to kindergarten. Also, homelessness. Homelessness is a very big issue in Columbus, Ohio. And a lot of the money that's going into the police system, some of that money could go into finding houses, getting people stabilized. And it, the, the list can go on. The list can really go on. You guys know the issues that are going on in Columbus. Um, and it's very big. And the thing is, we have the power to change it. And all over across America, every single police force, they have money to give. They don't need all that money. So we as the people need to stand up and say, take this money away and put it into things that will actually build the community up if you guys don't want to build it up. My fault, you know. No, 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 go off, off. man, no, of course. I mean, I agree with that completely, right? Because when we look at when um, time for budget cuts, usually what's on the chopping block is education and social services, right? Better yet, let's take it back in the 80s, right? 
war on drugs. Let's give more money to police. Let's give a 1994 crime bill, and let's take that, take that money away from you know mental institutions, right? Let's take that money away from our public schools. Let's take that money away from our after-school programs, right? So if I if I'm a young kid, I got nowhere to go after school. I like I'm hyper, but no one's really telling me how to how to control that, right? So if I'm hyper, they're saying no, sit down. If I if I don't sit down, we have a police officer come in and just really put, put, put you down, right? Um, so we really need to look at funding our social services and our educational systems, right? Primarily hiring um, minority teachers within our educational systems, right? So let's talk about kindergarten. I didn't have a black male teacher until I was in high school, and even I, that only had one. Never had a black right? male teacher until, so, I, until, I, until I went to HBCU. Exactly. Right, so if we're looking at a, our young black boy who's a six-year-old um, who's trying to get his sight words ready, but his teacher doesn't understand that his home environment may not have um, the proper resources for that, how are we equipping our teachers and our educational system to deal with that, to make sure that they're ready for kindergarten? Exactly. Right? How are we investing um, into our social services to provide more extracurricular activities for our young black men? Right? So how are we exposing our young black youth to the opportunities um, that are around our city? Right? So are, is the young kid in Linden knowing that there's a co is he going to that um, science center really understanding like, hey, I, I can be a scientist, I can be you know, an astronaut, not just getting everything from a tube, right, or his phone. Um, so yeah. But the main thing that a lot of people look over, um, our teachers have been taking budget cuts for years. I mean, they get defunded so much when it's time to go in, they lose money, people, like teachers, so, What's the difference between taking the money from somebody that's educating the youth and taking the money away from somebody that's enforcing the law? So there just has to be, there just has to be a balance between things. Definitely reinvesting in the black community is always gonna you know, build that generational wealth and uh, bring those things with it. But after experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic and so many innocent people dying, how do you go back to school in the fall? How do you mentally prepare for that to go back to school? I mean, you gotta ask yourself, what's the end goal, right? The end goal is to get your degree so you can come back and help your community, right? So my people aren't, aren't um, we're used to adversity, right? This isn't new to us. If you compare our experience right now to my great-grandparents, we're like, okay, you're living through a 1919 Spanish flu pandemic, you got a world war going on, and I'm not a citizen, and I got people trying to lynch me, and I can still get a college education, and raise a family, and have kids, and own my own land, you know, I don't think we have a choice but to succeed because our ancestors have already paved the road for us to succeed, right? At a point, you just have to look back and just, in my, in my beliefs, um, you just have to look, at a point, you just have to have faith. Um, growing up in a Christian home, um, always remember, I know me, I know personally, I'm covered in the blood of my Lord, Jesus Christ. So no matter what goes on, no matter what happens, I just have to have faith that things things are going to change. Things are going to be different. I'm not going to say it's I'm not going to say it's going to happen immediately, but it's going to happen. I promise you that. So honestly, I'm just covered in the I'm co I'm covered in the blood. So I'm 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 straight. I'm good. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely taking time. Definitely will take some time. When you look at statistics, it shows third grade is the average to determine the success of youth. What types of programming should be implemented to ensure the success of young boys of color? Ooh. What is one? I, I, I'll say, I mean, it's education and making sure that we're having sustained and continual learning. Right, so we look at, let's take for example, a private school versus a public school, right? That kindergarten in a private school, after they've learned their sight words, after they've learned you know, how to write their name, they're getting that big summer booklet and saying, all right, when you come back to the first grade, I need this entire booklet done to make sure that you're still on track to be in the first grade. We would go into our public schools, summer vacation, I'm just chilling. I'm on TikTok with my big brothers and stuff, right? So we look at um, one investing in having required summer reading for our kindergartners and our first graders and our second graders, right? Building partnerships with um, metropolitan libraries to say, you know, okay, summer reading, um, make sure that every CCS student or public school student has a summer reading challenge, right? Because if you're a kid, it's like, okay, if I can get a prize, if I can get coupons, I can go to Zumbizi Bay or the zoo, like, yeah, I'm a, I'll read this 20 minutes for you, like, right? Um, implementing in interventions for, you know, those third and fourth graders who may not be on grade level, right? So, um, 
let's take it for mental health. If I understand that you know you have ADHD or that you have depression or that you have anxiety, I'm going to implement an intervention to make sure you get well. Why aren't we doing the same with education? I'm not just going to let you fail and say, okay, well, you didn't make it this year, um, Mike. I'm going to still make, take you to the fifth grade. It's, it's cool. You'll yeah. be fine. You didn't make it fifth grade? I'm going to take you to the sixth grade, right? I'm in high school and I'm still having um, classmates who can't read on grade level. Then why are, why are we putting them in that situation to fail, right? That school to prison pipeline. As soon as we see a problem, we need to address that problem and solve that problem, right? Yes, um, first off, yeah, you did that. But um, a big thing is we have to look about their homes. A lot of third grade students go through traumatic homes. They don't know, and, and they come to school and then they have to learn. And then they have to do good on tests. While, while at home, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna go raw. Um, their parents are suffering from, from drug addiction. Um, th their, their father is beating their mom. Um, the, the things can go on. So we have to implement family stabilization plan. There should be a family stabilization plan. Get their parents jobs. I mean, because some of the because some of their parents they don't have jobs, and since and since education is mandatory at that age, um, they don't have the needs to provide for their student. Get them good meals so that they can go to school in the morning, ready to learn. So we have to implement that. Also, we should implement mentoring programs off the off the gate. Like that should like there should be somebody that when I when a third grader walks into school, I look up to him. I, I want to hear what he has to say in order for me to have success, and that mentor pushes them to success, sits down, reads to them, talks about their life, because you don't know what a third grader in, in, in the inner city Columbus could be going through. And the thing is, we overlook them just based upon, oh, they're a kid, they'll grow out of it. But, but, but the, sometimes they don't grow out of it, and that could be traumatic for, the entire, for their entire life. So we have to implement familiarization programs and mentor programs at that age. And even going off of that, making sure that our parents know that they're building a partnership with their local schools to uplift their, their children, right? So let's say even um, your parents aren't on, drug, aren't on drugs, right? They don't have any mental problems, but you know, your mom is working nine to five, right? Your dad is, let's take my example. My mother's a full-time college um, professor. My father's a pilot. My youngest sibling, Michelle, is the youngest of four children. So my parents are already very well spent, very well organized in how they're spending their time um, as a parent and also juggling their work life, right? So how is the school um, and government really bringing it, coming in and help that third grader say, okay, if your parent um, is bogged down um, with this, how are we helping that parent succeed, right? Or, or do we have a local PTA that's bringing in the Scholastic Book Fair to help you get up to that third grade reading level, right? Are we having that local PTA or that local um, parental group taking you on exposure field trips to, you know, the boathouse? Right, so you can see what Columbus really has to offer, and it's not just you know the kids in New Albany that come to the boathouse, right? So how are we actually building that partnership between our schools and our parents to build that trust to actually help that child succeed? And that's where we really need to bring back in funding our educational system and our social services system, right? Definitely, keeping our kids engaged and attacking the problem where it starts is you know one of our biggest goals. But Andrew, in this current moment. How do you think youth can get involved to affect policy or make change? Get into organizations and join organizations that give you the opportunity and the seat to actually have leadership roles and positions. That's my biggest way um, for youth to get involved. So for example, um, Worth Foundation, right? Um, it's a nonprofit that I co-founded back in 2016. Why? Um, President Trump was elected and a lot of um, my peers were like, well, why did that happen? We learned in school there's a popular vote and an electoral vote, but Hillary won the popular, but Trump won the electoral. Like, how does that work? How does my vote matter? So there's this disconnect in youth really understanding how to actually make policy, right? So we need to actually have organizations that say, okay, um, Eddie, you're 16, you want to learn how to actually create policy. Let me come over here and teach you how to, you know, talk with a local official. Right, too, too quick, we're, we're very quick to protest, right? That's just one facet of making change. We need to learn how to make policy, turn, move from protest to policy, right? Um, that's what we really need to do. And having local organizations like our Metropolitan Club, like our NAACP, like our Urban League, um, recruit our youth, right? So going into schools and saying, yeah, 
our stuff didn't stop in the 60s. We're still here, like Dr. King may be watching us, but we're still doing the work, right? So recruiting um, at a very young age um, into these organizations that equip you with the leadership skills so that when, you're, when you are mayor of Columbus or when you are um, chief of police, you're not just learning quick on the job, like, no, I've been doing this. I know how to write an agenda. I know Robert's rules. Like, what's up? Let's do this, you know? 100% agree. Um, to the vantage point of, if you look at the change that's going on right now, um, I'm going to be totally honest. Um, if the protests and everything did not happen, I highly doubt that those police officers would have been arrested, convicted so quickly, just based upon the change. So when you ask, what can youth do? Um, I'm going to be honest. I feel like the youth are involved. When you go out to the street, you see their faces. You don't see you don't see 40-year-old men um, out there leading everything. You see people that look just like me, my age, 19 years old, standing two feet, looking at, looking into the eyes of, of the, I'm not even going to call them the enemy, of the people that do not have mental composition of what's going on, or that, that they're blinded by their own greed, to the point that I feel like the youth 100% they need to get involved into these organizations immediately, not later down the line when they're 23, 24. No, you need to start now, because if you know it, then that can protect you for a lifetime. So yeah, just I feel like, I feel like they're involved, but they're going to get more involved, because it's definitely, there's some, something's going to click. I just have a feeling that something's going to click in everybody's mind, and something's really about to change. I think it's already clicking for us, though, yeah. right? So the biggest tester is November. Right? I, I highly, I'm going to no, vote. Vote, right? So vote. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it right now. You're going to see a higher um, voter registration for new voters. Exactly. Right? Because now it's like, okay, I'm seeing people marching in the streets, but people are telling me to vote. Okay, I'll vote. But then what happens after that? I, I click a box for uh, someone I don't know who's in Washington, but how are you helping my own community? Join local organizations. You protest and great. Right. What happens after that protest, right? We're great to, we're quick to fill out a Google form and email our local official, but no, talk to that local exactly. official, right? If we have a board member in a room, go talk to that board member. Don't just be so quick to say, these are my demands. Yeah, list those demands, but then actually know, okay, why can't we implement these demands? Well, there's a police union. Well, why do we have a police union? Well, because they want to um, negotiate and have a good contract. Okay, well, how can we implement that contract that is equitable for all of our um, citizens of Columbus, right? Too soon we're, we just see the public facing of a government agency. No, we need to know what actually goes on behind the scenes, right, of a, of a bureaucracy, right? And that's where you really get into the mindset of moving from a protest to policy. And, and youth, are, youth are doing it. And a very big thing is we have a lot of important people in the room right now. We have a, a lot of important people. Um, and I'm going to challenge everybody in this room. Do not just tell young people, if you know somebody that is eligible to register to vote, I challenge you to give them the raw answers of why they should vote. Don't just say you should vote. Because it gets blinded to a point where it's just like, I've heard, I mean, I, I was going to register, I, I already registered and everything like that. But it just goes to a point when I'm not with my parents. People come up to me and like, are you registered to vote? Explain to me why. Like, I'm just saying, like, a lot of, like, my generation, you just got to be raw. I'm going to just be honest with you. You have to be raw. And also, to the, to the very important people in the room, because you guys are all very, very important, it's time to have that conversation. It's time to have that raw intellectual conversation with our young people, because that's, that's what's not getting through sometimes, is that, like, they need, they need raw answers and raw judgment and raw everything. Like, don't sugarcoat anything, because life's never going to sugarcoat at all. It never will, because it'll hit you, and it'll hit you hard. But the thing is, we need to be prepared to get back up and make things change. And bring them to the table, too. So like, like Mike was saying, we got elected officials in here. Why can't you establish a youth internship to actually teach them those skills, right? If I know that we have a Board of Education member or a Franklin County treasurer in here, okay, how are we preparing our youth And let's say, high school you want to go to law school, I want to go to law school, you want to become a surgeon, right? How are we preparing those youth? Okay, so when you do go to college, I know how to write an agenda, I know how, how to make a budget, right? I know how to balance a budget, right? So how are we using our governmental agencies to prepare to give that baton off to the next generation, right? Because trust, if we're not in the room, we'll bring a folding table and sit down at the table for you. Trust. <laughs>
definitely agree with that. Uh, we're now going to open up the questions to the audience. We're going to take questions from our live stream and our live viewers. Uh, but while we do that, just one more question for you guys. Do you think the change that is happening right now is real? Is it lasting? Or do you think it's something that's going to kind of push off and, you know, move along? Oh, I'm going to be totally honest with you. My generation, this generation, they have the foot on the gas and they're not letting up. When I, pr I promise you, to the depth of my heart and my soul, this is not going anywhere. This is going, this is here to stay until we actually see some change. Cause I mean, it's always, oh, this will, I, people's timelines might've changed right back, but I promise you black lives still matter and they will forever matter no matter what. So I promise to this day, to the to the end of to, to the end of my lifetime, this is gonna keep going because we're gonna keep pushing until something changes, and that's that's for sure. I promise you. <laughs> oh, this feels like a real conversation, y'all. <laughs> um, change is like like President Obama said, it's never made never being a straight line. It may zig and zag, but ultimately we're gonna get there. And my biggest faith for our generation is that we are so. Um, focused on so many areas and putting our energies into changing so many things is that I'm excited for 2050. Like trust, we have climate change good at Thurnberg and 14 year olds um, rallying the world to have um, better climate um, controls, right? We have youth in Columbus and um, all over the nation really saying, yeah, black lives do matter, criminal justice, let's get this stuff going. We have March for Our Lives saying, yeah, guns in our schools are not things that should be going together, right? We have Malala Yusuf, um, I apologize um, for her name, um, Malala, right? Um, making sure that education is a fundamental right for our entire um, world, right? So you're seeing all across all these areas, youth, who aren't in elected positions, mind you, who don't have the power of the purse, who don't control the funding, still making these grand changes and really changing the minds of the adults, right? So if we're doing this now, wait until we actually are in City Hall, wait till we're actually in the White House and the Capitol building. Like, trust, it's gonna, it's gonna be fun. I'm looking forward to it. And that is real power right there where the youth comes in. Uh, we're gonna take our first question from the audience right here. How are you, ma'am? Hello. Renee Delane from Women Who Dare. First of all, I would uh, contest what you said about the VIPs because you three are the badass VIPs. <laughs> okay, my question is, two, actually two parts. Who would you choose for the VP, assuming Biden will win? And then if you could have your dream team, dream, dream team of a president and vice president, who are the two people you would choose? That's you. Yeah, CNN yeah, watching, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, at least for VP, I know um, Vice President Biden is stating that he wants a woman of color for that. Um, my biggest thing um, when you get into a position is are you experienced to actually use that position to its fullest capabilities? Um, for that, I know that Kamala Harris are being mentioned, Susan Rice are being mentioned, two of which are very intelligent um, um, and capable um, professionals. And I would really lean towards those two because, for one, Susan Rice knows, um, as a former ambassador to the, um, I would say, UN and also on the National Security Council, how Washington works, and also Kamala Harris being a former prosecutor from California and knowing um, how our Senate works can actually know how to move the levers of government for that, right? Um, so someone with a criminal justice background like Kamala Harris, um, who knows how to how Washington works. Because too soon we're very quick to have someone just say, okay, you have these great ideas, but if you come in, you're like an Obama and you're stonewalled by the opposing party, and you don't really know how to um, politic um, to get your initiatives through, we we're gonna hit a wall, right? Um, and your second part was my dream team for, um, Obama first. <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, I mean, he's awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's I mean, obvious. I mean, that's obvious. That's obvious. That's like, I mean, and then as a VP, I mean, um, I would go with Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, um, primarily because if you look at how he was able, as a Southerner. You said everything I was going to say. I mean, if you look at how, as a Southerner, <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, I can really just politic and yeah. actually negotiate and bargain to get a Civil Rights Act through um, in a very highly polarized time and know how to move the levers of government. That's a dream team right there. And yeah. Plus he's good at that shot. I'm gonna be totally honest. Uh, he just took everything I was about to say. So um, 
He got me. He got me. He took everything I was about to say. Thank you. Well, well, well thank you. Thank, thank you, Brad, for the bottom of us. Thank you, Brad, for the bottom of us. <laughs> I'm amazed at how knowledgeable you guys are. Fabulous. My name's Jane Scott, and I'm asking a question for some folks who, who send some things in online. Um, and I have a lot of questions. I'm going to ask some that haven't really been covered yet. A woman named Loya Hazel from uh, Cardinal Health. I'm, Mex I'm a Mexican immigrant who is having a hard time explaining to my family the oppression of black citizens in America. My family does not believe in such oppression since they have never dealt with obvious racism in their extreme la Latino hometown. How can we best teach my, my own minority community about these racism issues even though we've never experienced them directly, um, this kind of direct abrupt racism? That's a great question. That's a, actually a very great question. Um, I'm going to go back into, that we're, we're, we're going to go into the dictionary a little bit. We're going to go to sympathy and empathy. So you, you can sympathize for me, but, you, but, but that means you have pity for me. I don't want you to have pity for me, but, it, but you can have empathy and you feel where I'm coming from. You understand what's going on. Everybody needs to have an understanding. I would challenge them to actually just go on Netflix, watch When They See Us, watch um, 13, what else? Um, there's so many things that you could watch. Actually, actually, The Color Purple, go on Twitter and just look at it and just take, take, come out of your shoes and put yourself in the shoes of others and actually, and watch how that leads you and watch how that really brings you into the table. Like, I wouldn't want this to happen to myself. And this has been going on for hundreds of years for black folks. So it just goes into the mindset of 100%, I don't want this to happen to me, and I see what they're going through, I should most definitely have empathy and be like, 100%, we need to change, because I would never want this to happen to myself. So, just gonna keep it hot, Shin. Good afternoon, guys. Thanks for being here today. My name is Mike Carmichael, L Brands, and I'm a VIP, but, you know, whatever. Um, to Andrew's point earlier about letting kids know they can have a career as a police officer one day. I think that's important. My cool point about coming from a military family, one thing I see, and I wanted to get your opinion about it, is that we bring former military people in to police. Exactly. There is no buffer. There is no de-escalization de of what I faced in wartime to deal with civilians. There's a lot of PTSD going on, and I've experienced myself. I'm like, why are they so exactly. in your face? And I'm not black. Right. I, just, I don't get it. So when you're talking about on the street, off the street, I think there needs to be a time frame when they get hired to say, we need to do something about making sure you understand your new audience, right. your comments. Right. 100%, 100% agree with that. Um, based upon the six months, I, I didn't really get into it because I don't really want to like over explain everything. Um, but my implemented plan for the six months on the street, six months off the street, 100% will go into the background of we need to have actually counseling services because counseling services are really big because we don't really know like our, our police officers at, at the end of the day, they are people. They are human beings. They do have minds. And the thing is, we need to we need to talk to them. We need to have the conversation with them about, are you really ready? And there are tests implemented to even make sure that they are ready to even go on the street, actually deal with somebody that's 12 years old. Because because I promise you, somebody that just came from war has no business walking. I'm looking at the streets right now. It has no business walking up the street with a gun in his, in, on his side, talking about some, no, don't do that. What are you doing? Why are you moving? They run, done. It just doesn't make sense. So definitely, I understand. 100%. Um, I have one question here. Are black young men anxious? Explain. <laughs> with anxiety. Will you live with fear and anxiety? I have a question for the whole entire audience. Um, how many of you have had to talk with your parents about how to deal with a, um, deal with a, a, a police officer? Be honest. Just be honest. Who, who has had the conversation about what do you do at, at, at a traffic stop? How do you do everything like that? I want everybody to just look around at the room. Just look around at the room and look at the hands. Majority of those people are African Americans. So you can really see, it's not, I'm not going to say anxious, but it's just like, you just come to an agreement of like, why are, like, 
Like, why should my mom have to kiss me on my forehead every single time I have to go to the field to go play football? Because cause, cause, cause she doesn't know if I'm going to get stopped at, at a stoplight, and that could be the end of my life forever, and she loses her son. Because I promise you, I know Joy Bevin, she'll set this whole world on fire for this one. So it's just, it just goes to a thing of just like, you just, gotta, you just gotta look at things at a certain aspect of just like, some stuff just didn't happen. Like, why should I be afraid of the person that's trying to help me? Uh, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, Andrew, you mentioned the importance of uh, you know, community building and getting to know people. And one um, uh, sensitive topic recently has been uh, police officers in schools, serving as these school resource officers. Um, and many people say, well, that's, that's you know, the police trying to build a relationship with, with young people and students. So what are your thoughts about um, school resource officers and, and the role they, they play or, or should play? Let me preface this. These views are completely mine and do not reflect anything of Columbus City Schools. Um, let me just say that first and foremost. Um, I do believe that police officers in schools um, they need to have a sustained role in building that trust. So for example, if I look at my own personal experience at Columbus Alternative High School, um, the police officer there was simply patrolling the hallways, um, not really interacting with the students. You would maybe just see her sitting at lunch um, and just looking at you and having a really authoritarian figure with that. Um, so if we're, we are, if we do have police in schools, um, give them a role, right? So if we're gonna be building that community trust, teach a class. Like, actually get to know me and how I actually operate, right? So, um, teaching students, okay, as a police officer, this is how um, the police system works, right? I'm not just here on my wherewithal. Um, if we're going to have police officers outside of school, making sure that we have um, safety officials in the schools um, that can, are equipped to handle the um, modern dangers of a 21st century school, right? So if we see many people who are advocating for, well, why do we have police officers in schools and you, the last time you were in school was in like 1962? Um, things have changed since then. So we've had a Columbine, we've had a Parkland, we've had a Sandy Hook. Right, so I see why we why there's an argument for police officers in schools for protection, of course, yeah, because I don't want to give a teacher a gun, um, but we got to make sure that that police officer has a role and actually has um, in their um, job description. Okay, if you're going to be in a school, we need to one be um, cleared to be in that school by a licensed counselor, so that you're not just um, immediately throwing somebody down um, if they're routing this in the school. We need to make sure that your department actually has an equity policy for how to treat students within a school. Um, we need to make sure that those police officers are equipped to know that, okay, if I'm dealing with a child, that's very, very different than me dealing with a 34-year-old drug dealer, right? So, yeah. So Catherine Glenn Applegate from Action for Children asked, what is the number one change you would like to see in Columbus, Ohio? A football team. <laughs> um, the biggest change I want to see in Columbus, Ohio probably um, would be more elected officials that represent um, the fabric of Columbus as a whole. Right, because we understand that the biggest changes from Columbus um, come from our elected officials, but also our local businesses. Right, so if I can make this a little like a two-parter. Um, more youth elected officials, but also more minority-owned small businesses. Right, because we understand that um, green is the most important color if we're talking about colors. Right, so if we can build our Bhutanese communities, that's gonna be great. If we can build our Somali communities, that can be great. If we can build our black communities, that can be great, right? So as Columbus is an opportunity city that we're calling it, is an opportunity city for all. Hi, my name is Debbie Matthews. I happen to have the good fortune of having a great nephew who happens to be black. Um, he came out to Bowling Green from Massachusetts to play football. He had a job there as a bouncer in a bar. Two white men got into a fight. He broke it up. The police were called, and guess who they arrested? The black guy. Fortunately, I have a son who's an attorney, and he was able to get 
good representation that my niece probably could not have afforded. Uh, he now is working in Columbus for my youngest son, and we are so happy to have him with us here. Sure. So, all is well now. Yeah. So, all in the family. Thank you. Joshua Mitchell from The Ohio State University. You guys are doing a great job. Play on, I'm excited to see you at OSU in the fall. The issue of racial justice has been politicized and oftentimes compartmentalized. The loudest voices in the room regarding racial injustice are normally black, or if the conversation has been politicized, the loudest voices are normally from the liberal side or from the left. So what do you say to people who feel that racism is not their problem because they're neither black nor liberal? How do you address people who don't think racial injustice is their problem? I mean, black people in terms of social justice movements in this nation and fighting racism are the vanguard for social progress regardless, right? And I'm gonna bring it home to you real quick. We just had a Supreme Court decision that made it illegal for someone to fire you um, if you're a lesbian, gay, transgender, or bisexual, LGBTQ plus A. The legal basis for that was the 1964 Civil Rights Movement. It's 1964 Civil Rights Bill, excuse me, right? So trust, in the 60s, they weren't thinking about um, Stonewall, they weren't thinking about um, our gay community, but trust and believe, 50, 60 years later, we're still using the achievements of my ancestors to provide social progress for other social um, minorities and inequalities and groups, right? So the fact that you can say racism doesn't affect you is, I'm not gonna say, it's very ignorant. It's very I ignorant, mean, yeah. right? Because we know that if in my fight for progress, black people trust Fred Hampton, I'm gonna bring, bring along my white people. I'm gonna bring along my Native Americans. I'm gonna bring along my LGBTQ plus A to actually make sure that this society is equitable and just for everyone, right? Racism is just the, the tipping point. We, there's a whole um, diaspora of social issues that black people want to fight for, and racism is just one of them. Right. So let me go. Um, it goes back to what I said earlier. Um, it goes based upon sympathy and empathy. So you can, you can have sympathy for me, don't have sympathy for me, because that's pity. I don't want your pity. Uh, but to a point, you have to look at it at a point of come out of your shoes, come out of your fancy house, come out of um, your comfortable. You have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. And I promise you, in this time period, it's been going on forever. So, I mean, you're always gonna to have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable because that's how you see change. So, you have to come out of your shoes, put yourself in somebody else's shoes, and actually look at it of a fact of if, if it was flipped, if it was flipped, how would you feel? Would you want the black community to be like, that don't mean nothing to me, I don't want nothing to do with that. You would, you would most definitely want their help to stand up and make a change, not just for themselves, but for the whole entire world, for the whole entire system. You better, yeah, yeah. Even with that, what we see largely in our society is that um, you love black culture, but you don't love black people, right? <laughs> that's, that's what it is at the end of the day. So if I go to an, a New Albany, yeah, I'm gonna see some people with some Jordans and some LeBrons on, but let's go to Linden real quick and let's go shoot some hoops over Woodward Park. I bet you you will see a very, very stark difference, right? You got the new Meek Mill, other side of America, you listen to all the, all the words, but I can't say the N-word. Well, why can't I say the N-word? Yeah, 100%. Like, don't look at, like, okay, so I'm an athlete. Um, always been an athlete. But the thing is, don't love me when I'm on the field. Love me when I'm off the field. So when I'm over here making the tackles, getting the interceptions, everything for you, for you to cheer, for you to be like, oh, go team, go team. But when I'm off the field and I got my hand up and I'm saying black, and black lives matter, I 100% want you to be behind me and say, Black Lives Matter. All right. Plan, I think we're gonna. Offering your insights. One of the things that uh, I've noticed through the years for me as a white man is that racism, structural racism and oppression and white supremacy is not a, it's not a black problem, it's not a people of color problem, it's actually a white problem. And I, what I would say is we're, where I work at the medical center, 
we're trying to launch some things about examining white people's part in this and how it is an interlocking system that actually will punish you if you try to give up privilege, uh, how it deeply it runs, how it's embedded in our head in those waters that we swim in. This is my first meeting here. I came because of the programming and I joined. I'm kind of interested in maybe using the connections here as a networking uh, opportunity to maybe start a process where white people uh, in, a, in a way to, to keep ourselves honest uh, engages with some material like the book White Fragility. Uh, there's a podcast called Seeing White and, and it's about really examining whiteness as <clears throat> the force that drives all this. Um, my name is Brian McMichael. I work at the Medical Center um, but I'll talk to anybody later about that. Big thing, a big thing I would like to see. Um, the only way to beat racism is to challenge it any way you see it. It doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, brown, green, the blue, everything. The only way to defeat racism is by challenging it any time you see it. So that doesn't mean just because I challenge it doesn't mean you can't challenge it. Doesn't mean you can't challenge it. That's the only way we're going to beat this is if everybody collectively challenges it. Thank you, gentlemen. That was really enlightening, audience. Thank you for the great uh, questions. You know, we, we, we started today, um, my remarks included words like uh, complicated, complex. Um, the, the three of you were able to lay out some really actionable, um, thoughtful solutions to the, the problems that we're facing, and uh, you, you've You've simplified things in a way that I think is really valuable for people to uh, to consider. It remains difficult, but uh, uh, you've given me a lot of optimism uh, on on a path forward. And uh, working at Ohio State, we've gone through lots of diversity trainings, implicit bias trainings, and we've paid a lot of money for that type of consulting. And uh, for twenty-five dollars today, I got a real education on uh, on some solutions and an even better deal for our virtual audience. So uh, thank you for your, your thoughtful comments today. Um, we, uh, on, on July 15th, uh, we will welcome young black women to the stage uh, to hear their perspective on, on these issues as well. Uh, we hope you will tune in next Wednesday at noon online or in person here at the Boathouse as we discuss the social determinants of health with Bo Chilton. CEO of Impact Community Action, and Dr. Olewola, Chair of the Department of Family Medicine at Ohio State. We are grateful for our live stream partners, WOSU Public Media, PNC, Dispatch Media Group, and our online virtual seat patrons. Thank you very much. And special thanks again to our speakers, Michael Bivens, Andrew Pierce II, Play on Patrick, thank you very much. We hope to see you in person soon, but until then, be well, stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you.